Rock. The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Rock Pile Report podcast live on YouTube. Guys, what the hell is going on around here? <laughs> I, I'm sure it's a question a lot of people are asking. Chris, what time did you wake up today? Uh, three oh five. So when you woke up at three o'clock in the afternoon and you took a look over at your nightstand, you you know you pick up your phone. You're probably thinking a lot of things. You're probably thinking about, all right, I have stuff I got to do before the game. <laughs> Buffering says our cash is okay. Okay, well. We're not receiving enough video. We're, we're, oh, guys, guys, we might be hitting it. We might be hitting the wall like Dale Earnhardt right out of the first turn this time instead of turn three. All right. So when you wake up and you take a look over at the phone laying on your nightstand, when you pick it up, is one of the first things that you see, like, are you expecting to see news that the Buffalo Bills acquired Amari Cooper? The only thing that I had on that is you texted me in all caps amari cooper <laughs> along with five other things that i missed <laughs> so this is what i love like the, like what happens to a person who has like a midday shift or you wake up later in the day you wake up and you're a babe in the woods you're totally unaware that like the future of the buffalo bills is just wildly skewed in a different direction and you're just standing there in your underwear completely unaware that the future's changed I love that. Yeah, well, we do have a a new puppy, and I could hear him barking out in the uh, in his. He has a playpen. Jessica bought the dog a playpen, so we have a playpen that the dog is in while Jessica's at work, and I spend my Tuesdays sleeping. <laughs> Here's what I love, guys. We've got so much to get to tonight. Obviously, the Amari Cooper news is gigantic. We're here to recap our game against the Jets. But I want to start this with a thing. First of all, if you guys experience any buffering, please let us know in the comments. We're trying to run some experiments over here with what we're doing with our video production and kind of some of the video quality stuff we're working on to try to make the experience better for you. I mean, you have to look at my teeth. No one wants to see these things in high definition as it is. But... We're trying to play with some things. I just want to know what the visual effect for you guys is. As Chris puts his chains on over here, he's going to have to recap for you the fact that I almost had to go shopping for a new producer to the podcast this week. Yeah, if uh, oh, there's one chain on, you go here. This is that buffering. Specific- there it is. No, it says cash okay on on the screen right here. It says cash. Okay. Yeah, but I can see it. All right. Let me. So uh, I've known for a hot minute that I've needed new tires. And if you live in Buffalo, you might do the same thing I do. If you need new tires and it's July, you go, well, I'll just wait till the winter. So I get the absolute best tires uh, on my vehicle and they're brand new right for uh, winter, winter season. So that's what I did. I've known for a couple months. I need new tires. Just put I'm going to put it off until uh, until the fall slash winter when we get our first snowfall. And my vehicle had other ideas because I was on my way home from work on Sunday and I got a flat tire on the 190. And there is a nice gash on the backside of my tire. The inside of, on the wheel well side is where it just split open. And I'm I guess if it was a front tire. I would have uh, careened into the wall. It would have been way worse. But uh, and then as we go, last one here, last last chain and new chain. Look at that. You see that? We got a football. This is hilarious. Uh, we got a football on my gold chain. This is how Babbage, this is how Babbage and Joe Brady should walk around the facility from now on. Just multiple gold chains. And I specifically wore a black shirt tonight so that this would pop. I'm like, let's fucking go to let's go. Fuck this. Let's shut this down because you see we got an error error message. We'll pack it up. We'll take all this to Caputi's. We'll be live by 930 tonight. (laughs) (laughs) Now now the cash is going up. That's not good. Yeah. No, it's not good, Chris. It's not good. So we're here talking about week six, the New York Jets, Buffalo Bills, 23 Jets, 20. I've got your stats of the game. 
Real quick, since we're having buffering issues, and I want to get to the meat of the show anyway. Interesting stats from the game. Pressure to sack ratio. Josh Allen was pressured 10 times, or at least our offensive line allowed 10 individual pressures. Zero sacks on Josh Allen. Rodgers, okay, five pressures, allowed, or at least zero sacks given up by any individual lineman because Josh was able to bail him out with his, his athleticism. Rodgers had five pressures allowed to by his offensive lineman that directly led to three sacks. In the red zone, the Bills are three for four, and they are currently sixth in the NFL. The Jets were one for four. 18th in the NFL, and it shows. It shows. The wide receivers for the New York Jets, and this almost plays into some of the issues that you know just kind of drove today's trades and the trade activity that you saw this this afternoon. The New York Jets had five drops from their wide receiver group, seven contested targets, two 100-yard performances, and two wide receivers in the bottom 14 of the entire NFL for separation this week, and two in the bottom 20 for cushion allowed by the opposing defense. So they're not getting any sort of natural separation. And at the same time, they're also not getting the type of production or the execution on plays that you need to have from your wide receivers. Meanwhile, if you're the Buffalo Bills and you look at our wide receiver and our pass catcher statistics, our most productive and efficient pass catcher was a fucking running back. I digress. Moving on. Penalties. Okay. 204 yards on 22 called penalties. That's that's vomit worthy. Ray Davis. 20% of his runs came against eight or more men in the box. 71% 71% of his rushes, his rushing yards came after contact, and he looks amazing in a 10-gallon hat. A 10-gallon hat. Chris, him sitting next to SVP doing Sports Center with a cowboy hat on was not something I had on my bucket list for the no. day. Like, there was a lot of crazy shit that went on during that game. And then, of course, it ends with a dude in a cowboy hat, and I go, I am really living a dream. This isn't real. This is all just some football fever dream that we all just lived. I think that scene from Rick and Morty where they go and they like do their like sort of a thing like where they, they fake flying into the Death Star and then they blow it up and they sit and they get back in the spaceship and they both just have like an emotional breakdown because it was just such a nerve wracking experience. I feel like that's how I felt after this game, just emotionally wrung out because I didn't drink much. You know, it's a Monday night. It's a late game. I'm kind of tired. So I didn't drink a ton. And just, just by the time it's over, like here's my wife, my poor wife, trying to lay on the couch and sleep. And I'm just walking around now incensed. I've had two cocktails and one beer and I'm waving my hands around wildly because there's nothing like I'm too agitated now. Even though the bill's won, I can't sleep now. It it was crazy how this game went down the stretch from where it started. And I want to get all the negativity out early because this is a fun podcast. I came here to have a blast and to talk about a lot of really, really interesting facets of not just the game, but where the team is now post Amari Cooper trade. But there's some things we got to talk about, guys. First of all, has NFL officiating just like is this has to be the all time low, right, Chris? Yeah, I don't think it could possibly get any worse than this. Adrian Hill, last night's official, is a legitimate rocket scientist, a legitimate rocket scientist. He works at John Hopkins Applied for Applied Physics and Sciences Division. I smoked pot with Johnny Hopkins. <laughs> what is that from? Step Brothers? Yeah. Yeah. Me and uh, what? Sloan Kettering. It was me and Sloan Kettering. We're blazing that shit up every day. She's like, you don't know anyone named Sloan Kettering. <laughs> yes, I did. Me and Johnny Hopkins. You didn't smoke pot with Johnny Hopkins. He is a singularly terrible NFL official. Okay. Singularly terrible. In 2023, the average per game, right, was 83 yards. 83 penalty yards per game for the entire 2023 season. 10 of Adrian Hill's 2023 games last year were well above that. Nine of them went for over 100 total penalty yards. 
2024, the average across the NFL is up to 93 yards per game. We know that refs have gotten a little more litigious. They've gotten more involved. So far in 2024, Adrian Hill's crew is averaging 133 penalty yards a week, and he's hit 150 or more three different times. Three. How does this happen? How do you skew so far away from your corollaries and no one steps in? Chris, Chris, give me a boo. This We should boo this man. I got to get it. Hold on. Of course you do. Well, we've got cash experience. Yep. I have to find it. Guys, Adrian Hill is a terrible NFL official. The stats back that up. His overjudicious nature, but it's not even just the overjudicious nature. It's the disorganization you see when you look at some of the things that were happening, like late in the game. There was a <laughs> the buffering circle is as annoying as the yellow flags last night, Chris. That's for you. <laughs> Cleared the cash. So what's happened? So, so then maybe you need to do a little research on how to stop the buffering issues for our live. Shows. Well, I did. I I reset the cash on our. So clearly that's video. not. But so clearly that's not it. So you want to bag out and back in? Get no. Get but do better. <laughs> You, you and Sean McDermott can both do better. So he, you and Tyler Bass and Sean McDermott, I'm going to put you all in the same boat and Adrian Hill. Since we're here talking about NFL officials, there was a, there was a moment last night, late in the game. Like I'm looking over my notes from last night while I was watching it. There is a moment late in the game in the third quarter. The fact that they have to get together and discuss every single penalty Right. And they took over two minutes of actual time, almost three minutes to figure out if a false start or an offside should be called. And they couldn't figure out who to blame for this. Eventually, offsides was called in the Jets. But the fact that your crew needs to sit there for two and a half to three minutes to figure out who caused the foul. What are you looking at then when you throw the flag? Chris, it almost seems like a lot of last night's penalties were one official or a side judge or a back judge just deciding, well, that that looked funny. Throw a flag and we'll figure it out once the laundry hits the turf. Yeah, that's insanity. You can't just you cannot justify refereeing a football game like this. There are no sports that operate under these premises. There aren't any not successful ones anyway. And then the the most frustrating part, Chris, something you touched on when we were talking off air about this. Like there's so many moments when it comes to officiating, but there's a reason that I don't watch a lot of regular season basketball. And it's because the last three minutes of an NBA game take a half hour because every team has timeouts and every team has penalties to burn or fouls to give. And they just burn through these things and it elongates the game unnecessarily. Last night. With all of the fouls that got called in that fourth quarter, it extended the quarter by an extra 18 minutes. You don't think, or well, maybe it's not a full 18 minutes. I think it was like 15 and change. But imagine adding 15 minutes of real time to a sporting event just because you can't stop throwing flags. That's insanity. No one would put up with this as a spectator, except for us, because we love the NFL and we're idiots. We're drawn to it like moths to the flame. It is the most popular American sport to watch in a televised fashion. And yet then you do. You, let's move on from just the, the amount of time and the things. Let's look at some of the just the abjectly stupid parts of this. Right. How about the, I saw my very first penalty, my very first ever penalty for personal foul for improper conversation with an official improper conversation what are we talking about here D- my wife laughed her ass off she goes do you know how many times i could flag you for improper conversation with the dumb shit you come up with to respond to my questions <laughs> the tweets that came out of this were amazing right one of them uh jim garrity Right. He's a writer for uh, I think it's Politico had a tweet about the improper conversation with an official. Like, what would you have to say to get flagged for improper conversation? This guy tweeted out Pluto's a planet and the ref goes, hey, that's 15 yards, buddy. We don't believe in that shit over here. (laughs) 
a hundred yards of penalties against both teams. That's crazy. And Adrian Hill, like there, there there's a thing. Adrian Hill goes, uh, Tony, Tony, tr- tr- Jesus Christ, Tony Roman, Troy Aikman had, I think what's going to go down is a famous line in the aftermath of this game. Adrian Hill is going to need a SAG card at the end of this because he's been on screen for so much, so long tonight. Like, this is absurdity. The fact that the referees are allowed to interfere with a game to this degree. Now, guys, here's what we're going to do. Chris has a concept. We're going to try to relaunch the stream. Make sure you come back because I've got some really damning statistics about how those penalties that got called in the fourth quarter impacted the outcome of the game. It's going to drop your jaw when you hear just how just how insane the degree of the penalties and the impact that they had on the and the state of play was. Guys, we're going to back out of the stream and relaunch it. Make sure you come right back. One of the most damning aspects of this entire thing is that when you take a look at the penalties and the way that they were called. Nine flags in the first half, Chris, that that seems like a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. Nine flags in the first half of a football game, 17 of them in the second, which is literally double the number of flags, almost double that you saw in the first half. And what's crazy is when you look at the fourth quarter and you think about what went on in that fourth quarter, and then you take a look at the plays that were ran versus the penalties that were called, you end up in a place where there were there were six penalties for 10 or more yards called over the course of the quarter pivotal moment of a tight game and there were only five plays run by either team's offense that generated more than 10 yards of offense i want you to wrap your head around that for a second when you think about the impact of officiating on football games there was that there were more Big penalties called, then there were explosive plays on offense for either team involved in the fourth quarter of a tight football game. That's an embarrassing look for the entire NFL. And it's a detriment to the watchability of the sport. When you sit back, Chris, you said it, you don't watch basketball. No, why would I watch basketball? Tell me that the, the like the final couple minutes, even college basketball, like during the final four, the last three minutes takes 10 minutes to play. Yes, because if they get a shit ton of timeouts. Imagine doing that to a football game. It's wild. I can't wrap my head around it. And honestly, it's a detriment to the experience of anybody trying to watch that football game because you've taken all of the joy. Whether it's because you're t- you're, any of the emotion just gets sucked right out of the game and what's left is just frustration. You're just left saying, okay, can I run that? Like the re- the, the official, or excuse me, the commentator started making a joke every time there was a hit. That Taylor Rapp hit on Garrett Wilson in the end zone somehow doesn't get flagged. But then later they're throwing a flag because somebody said mean things to an official about a dumb play that they called it's like the the referees are that girlfriend who nags you and nags you and nags you and then you snap at her and then they go why are you being mean to me and my wife hates it when i make that voice because she goes you're making all of us women sound dumb I'm, i'm not making all women i'm not making a general statement about women what i'm saying is the referees in this moment like the, 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 when you see things like that happening, Chris, how many times in your lifetime have you ever seen someone get penalized for something they said to an official, like in the middle I, of a dead ball situation? I don't think I've ever seen it. <laughs> You've never seen it. That's how bad this officiating crew was last night. And it ruined the finish. I mean, we'll take the win. And obviously, Josh Allen's last minute kind of gutsy ad hoc play call to seal it. Like that took that. I think that got everybody up off the couch a little bit. But at the same time, like you've done such a detriment to what could have been an amazing finish to a football game with all of the nonsense penalties and all of the detritus that comes along with that. 
you made the officials for another game the focal point. They're the conversation, not the players, not the talent, not the execution, not the things. Chris, we don't pay hundreds of dollars a year for season tickets to watch officials. No, we don't. We go to see high level execution of a sport that we enjoy. So when they decide to take center stage in a football game like that, you're not only robbing like you're not only stealing from the players, you're also robbing every single person who paid good money to watch that product. You're stealing from them. It's awful. And the NFL has to like there's no accountability for it. I think that's the most frustrating piece. These officials, Adrian Hill is still getting primetime football games, despite all the statistics I just gave you about how he's an over officious jackass. But it doesn't matter. (laughs) The fact that they have to have as many conversations as they have to and that they pick up as many flags as they do. His squad is not good, and yet they're getting primetime games. That's embarrassing for the NFL, and it's a detriment to everybody who has to watch it. And I just sit here going, what did we do to deserve this, Chris? What did we do to deserve that officiating crew in this game last night? Yeah, I have no idea. That wasn't the only thing that sucked about last night. One of the things that really bothered me, and it's I want to talk about a concept here. It's accountability, right? For, well, actually, for, before we switch gears, NFL officiating can kiss my ass. I've had it with them. And I think that if the NFL doesn't step in here and do something significant soon, they are going to ruin the product that they're like, Chris, they're, they're, they're the money pig, right? They never say no to a dollar. They find new ways to generate more revenue. But if you allow this type of thing to continue, how far do you think you can push it? Like, it's an interesting experiment, if you want to call it that. How far can we push our viewers before they just say enough is enough? I'll be interested to see how that goes. Now, I also want to talk about, before we switch gears and talk about the good stuff, I want to talk about what accountability means to the 2024 Buffalo Bills. I think that we're going to get something of a crash course in it. I think that over the next couple of weeks, we're going to find out exactly what accountability means to this football team. And when I say that, I mean a couple things. Uh, first of all, Chris, if we want to talk about accountability, there's Tyler Bass. Yeah. He's Ty- on a short leash. Dude, the short leash doesn't. Chris, they didn't bring in anyone today for workouts. If you were going to work out a new kicker, you usually do it on the day immediately following a game because it's everybody else's off day. And, you know, they'll call Reed and they'll say, Reed, we need you at the facility to snap. And they'll call in Sam Martin and say, hey, Sam, Reed, we need you to come down because we've got this guy, this guy and this guy coming in for workouts today. Just because it's because we want to see what's out there. We want to know whose leg is what we want to see what's on the market. The fact that in the aftermath of that game, they didn't bring anybody in to work out shocking to me and the where i start to talk about accountability chris you know sean mcdermott has been preaching this concept right of accountability and do your 111th right like how long has that been part of our mantra oh that since he got here everybody like greg thompson from cover one grills a ribeye The night before every single game, because it's like, I'm doing my 111th. That's how ingrained into the culture of this football team that concept is. So how can you as a coach who believes this and pounds the table for this and supposedly has built your culture around this idea of every single person is to do their job. How do you look yourself in the mirror today and tell yourself that you're still doing the work and that you're still doing a good job enforcing this thing when you've got Tyler Bass? running around out here having the type of season that he's having now on the back of what was one of the worst seasons Bill's kicker has had in a long time. Like effectively, he was one of the bottom 10 or 12 kickers in the NFL last year. This year, he's on pace for more of it. And he's done nothing to show the Bills that he can live up to the contract extension he received. And so now you have to recognize that you have a problem. Chris, if you want to do me a favor, Google NFL kicker rankings. I just want to see it just statistically. 
you know, here we are six weeks into the season. The first like one third of the season is over. Let's see. Ranking you, the top. Do you want, I mean, all of it's like fantasy football related. Okay. Can you go to this? CBS sports. Okay. CBS sports kicker rankings. Where do you think? Where's Tyler Bass? Probably 20. That would be my guess. I don't think he's in there. Go go to NFL.com and just look at NFL.com and kickers. If you Google that, I guarantee it'll come up with the numbers because we're talking about kick percentage. They're measuring just raw stats. Fantasy rankings. That's all we got. <sighs> what a mess. Okay. Well, realistically, kick. He's five. <laughs> According to fantasy. Kick percentage NFL. You should have gave me that info. Yeah. Kick percentage. That would have helped if you said that. Yeah. So right now, NFL player kicking stats 2024. Right now, Tyler Bass is, let's see, field goals attempted, field goals made, Games played, points, field goal percentage. So if I Google, so if I sort this by field goal percentage, Tyler Bass is tied for 28th in the NFL. Chris, you are a team that the margins are already razor thin for you. You watered down your offense intentionally. You slotted some things around on your offensive line. You intentionally went cheap at wide receiver. You need your kicker to make points wherever possible. And in fact, if anything, it would help if your kicker was living up to the contract you gave him when you extended him because you thought he was going to be a dynamic weapon for you. When I remember an Arizona game, we're in a dome. I think he hit a 60 yarder. It makes sense. Those days are long gone. And what we have is the shell of a kicker. And yet everything I hear is, you know, Sean McDermott's quotes. Well, those are kicks he knows he has to make. Okay. That's like you saying, well, my five-year-old knows he probably shouldn't throw that in the house, but he did it. I mean, <laughs> that's the same statement. It has the same energy to it. And I hate the fact that what we're doing is we've taken it. We've gone from being a team that believed in the culture of everybody does their one eleventh and we all succeed to here's a guy who we all can see with our own two eyes mechanically is broken. You know, the concept of kicking a football is highly mechanical. These guys, like, do you wonder why they're weird, mercurial dudes? It's because they're like NHL goalies. Chris, how many NHL goalies are out there that are just weirdos? All of them. <laughs> like Ryan Miller all was weird. All of them. Justin Tucker's a, like what he does, opera, and he's got all these weird ri pregame rituals that he does. So I look at this and I say to myself, it, it, like, and we've also seen it historically, Mike Vanderjagt is a perfect example of a guy who was really, really effective right up until the day he wasn't. And he fell off a cliff and was unrecoverable. And so what do you do with that? How do you find accountability for this person who you've like, you've made what you said was your standard clear. Everybody has to do their one eleven. Here's a guy who is not pulling his own weight. How do you reconcile this with a team that is already starved for talent and a number of skill positions and that just because of the salary cap constraints, you don't have the depth you need. You have to have those points. You're going to lose games eventually because of this. And the kick, the missed kicks by Zerline and like, I'm almost mad. Like, I'm not mad we won. And it sounds stupid to say it out loud, but I'm almost angry because it lets him off the hook. There's a lot of fans who will just point to this and go, well, we won the game, so it doesn't matter. Bass's mistakes are going to be fine. They're going to be fine right up until they're not. And by that point, it'll be too late to do anything about it. Now, Chris, if you want to go to Spotrack and look for free agents, Spotrack free agent tracker and tell me who's out there as kickers. I don't know that you can go out to market and just immediately find someone better, right? There's not a, a whole lot of kickers who you're going to find on the street at this point in the season who you would point at and say, I can tell you that's an upgrade over my current kicker. But to not be looking is insulting to every other every other one of the 52 guys who suit up on Sunday and go out there and play and have to wait for Tyler Bass to get his opportunity to let everybody down. And Reed and I have had like some jokey conversations, but I think there's a little bit of uh, it only gives you three. 
<laughs> Brandon McManus. Randy Bullock. Riley Patterson. So these are just the guys who were on rosters last year. There's well, only- McManus is McManus wouldn't be that bad of a choice, but he was but he was, he was clear. Cu- he was cleared for his uh yeah. I touch women inappropriately without them without them telling me stop it. And that all got cleared up. Now I don't know if that means he's innocent, but what I know is is that he's not being charged with anything. Now, as we know from the Von Miller situation, that doesn't mean anything. But what I'm saying is you have options and to not look at them at all is an insult to the rest of the guys on the roster. I think it's a mistake by this coaching staff. I think you need to send the message. Hey, everybody has to do their one eleventh, especially now when our room for error because of our talent d- deficiencies in a lot of places is so thin. We can't afford to give up those three points anymore. We can't have any more of these mixed miss point after attempts. Chris, that field goal that he missed last night, the ball was never even close coming off his foot. They go, well, the ball got tipped. It was already going to go fucking into the stands. What? It was tipped by the kid who caught it in the front row? Yeah, I completely missed the netting. Like, that's Behind the, the uprights. This isn't it didn't just get, a- I don't think it got touched. It didn't look like that. No. And I just, I don't care. At the end of the day, I don't care. Make the kicks or don't. If you don't, we will find someone else to do it. If we're a competent organization that believes in accountability. You know, I'd go for uh, Randy Bullock simply because he's fat. <laughs> Remember fat Randy Bullock? I think he would uh, endear himself well to the <laughs> to the Bills community and the amount of chicken wing spots we have around here. Uh, fat Randy Bullock. <laughs> And it, and then it's like Sean McDermott doesn't get a pass either. You know, Sean McDermott with his whole end of the first half fiasco. So I had a tweet about it. You can check it out over at Rock Pile Report or Chris and Post if you want to add a screen cap of it here in the corner just so everyone can see it. I think I made my thoughts pretty clear. Like, And what I've found about this play in the aftermath is that how you see it is completely based on your preconceived biases. If you are a person who is wired to enjoy, like I like Sean McDermott and I don't see him as the problem, then you will blame the players and their lack of execution for what went wrong on the Jets converting a Hail Mary attempt. If you're a person who already has a kind of a dim opinion of Sean McDermott, then you blame him for this. And I think that it's the chicken and the egg. No one can ever be, quote unquote, right, because there's truth to both of it. Yes, our defensive backs probably should have knocked the ball down instead of Taylor Rapp trying to intercept it. Now, with that being said, Chris, how many years have we been burned in places where the defensive backs haven't knocked down balls that they should have? Yeah, we got a Hail Mary problem. A Hail Mary problem, the fourth down pass that Cam Lewis didn't know to knock down against Justin Jefferson in that uh, that Minnesota Vikings loss a couple years ago. There is a recurring theme of defensive backs not having an understanding of when to just knock the ball down. And everyone goes, well, it's on the players for not being able to execute. And the thing that I've pushed back about is this. Okay, you can blame the players. One, I don't think the ball ever, because they're like, well, there's four players within a foot of the ball. How do they not knock it down? I don't think the ball should have been there in the first place. I think that if you, first of all, you're the head coach. So when your defensive coordinator calls down and says, hey, I'm going to run two defensive tackles and I'm going to take my 270 pound defensive ends and make them play coverage near the sideline. Chris, do you know how many times Max Crosby and Chris Jones have played coverage for their respective teams over the last two seasons? Mm -mm. Less than five. Do you want to know why? Because their coordinators know, and when they do, they don't, they sure as fuck aren't playing the sideline. It's because their coordinators know and their coaches know. Chris Jones is not an asset to me watching the boundary. He's an asset to me rushing the passer. Groot and Epinesa are not an asset to me covering the sideline. You see that up there? What's that? That is our roster. Oh, yeah, you're full of tall people. Why why aren't you putting Dawson Knox out there to knock it down? We know we can't catch. 
So you just <laughs> so if his knock, hands got anywhere yeah. near the ball, it would just hit the ground by it, default. You knock down the ball. Matt Collins, Keon Coleman, Dawson Knox, Dalton Kincaid, all six four. Why are they not out there on Hail Mary protection? And this is my frustration with the McDermott experience so far. It's this concept of everybody wants to give him a pass for this. And I say, first of all, you're not using your pass rushers to rush the passer. So you're guaranteeing that he's going to have a platform to throw from. He's going to be comfortable. He's going to have time. You guaranteed that by virtue of how you schemed the play. So your philosophy is dumb. Your schem- well, first of all, you're schematically broken. Then philosophically, you're protecting against a field goal. You're, you're inviting them to take a shot downfield by not putting any pass rush pressure on the quarterback. You created the exact environment that you weren't prepared for by not putting larger players who know what to do when a ball is in the air. You created the the space for this thing to happen to your defensive backs in the end zone. And then you walk, have the audacity to walk off the field. And as they come to you and say, well, what were you thinking there? He goes, well, we were trying to defend against the field goal attempt. You know, we wanted to keep him out of field goal range. You only picked that because that's what you would do. If you were in the offense's shoes, you would play for a field goal. And that's why in Sean McDermott's head, he goes, this is the right decision. So whether the call came from Babbage, whether the call was his own, who cares? He co-signed it because he believes that this was the right way to play it. Because if I was on offense, this is what I would be doing. I would be trying to get into field goal range and kick a field goal and go to the locker room. Right or wrong, Chris? Yeah. And so in that way, Sean McDermott is also not doing his 111th. He's not pitching in. And it's it's how many more weeks do we have to deal with this where you're you've been in the league for eight years and there's things like this that you don't know. And what's more alarming is that your defensive backs, it's burned you how many times from different personnel groups, whether it's Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer, whether it's Taylor Rapp and Damar Hamlin, whether it's Cam Lewis, you keep getting screwed because these players do not know to knock the ball down. That tells me you and your staff aren't teaching it. Whose job is it to ensure it's being taught? Whose job is it to ensure that the right personnel are on the field in the right places to make sure that your play defensively has the highest probability of success rate? That's the coach, right? Yeah. yeah. So why is he getting a pass in all this? I don't think he should. No. But that's my viewpoint. And like I said, the way you feel about this play will tell you a lot about where your preconceived biases lie. And I think that we all need to get used to the idea of this will happen again. The whole, we're going to learn from that. Fuck. You said said that against Kansas City. You've been in the league for eight years. And you said that, what, a week ago? (laughs) You and your, like, he's learned, he's clearly learned from Ron Rivera. He's clearly learned from Ron Rivera, where you just keep getting second chances and third chances and fourth chances. And, hey, we'll learn from this. It'll be fine. How long was Ron Rivera with the Panthers? Give that a goog for me. Eight or nine years, probably. Most coaches don't get that run without winning a Super Bowl. And so I believe that because he comes from that tree and because it's the, the it's the Andy Reid thing. Nine years fired in season of his ninth year. You're conditioned to believe that you're just going to keep getting bites at this apple. At a certain point, this has to stop. Or you actually have to internalize some of this information and action it. It's just so incredibly frustrating. But, Chris, we didn't come here to bitch and rally the entire night. Like, We could. We're good at it. We're on top. And yeah. We're on top for a reason. We're on top of the AFC East, and it didn't Two happen. Two-game lead? Two and a half. Two and a half. The Ray Davis show last night was incredible. Dude, you know what he reminded me of? Hmm. This is what I like about Ray Davis from last night. He was decisive. And he had patience and his patience reminded me of like a Le'Veon Bell in his prime, how we would just let the blocks develop and then smash the hole. You know, the other day which is what I do a lot. <laughs> yeah. OK. <laughs> Le'Veon Bell tweeted out the other day because somebody posted a clip and they were like, look at this patience. And Le'Veon Bell quote tweeted it and said, I never ran full speed. Not ever. <laughs> <laughs> I was never running full speed. 
Like that was impressive for a rookie. Against that Jet D line. I mean, you got Quinn and Williams. Who else do they have on that line? Quinn and Williams, uh, Will McDonald. Um, yeah, they're not slouches. No, and they they have a very good defense. Not a great run defense, but a good defense. And in that way, the Bills really came out with a solid game plan. Even being down James Cook, they said, no, no, no. Running the ball is how you beat the Jets. So let's run the football. And they committed to it. And I give them a lot of credit because it worked in spades. And Ray Davis on the like the first half, he was the Bills offense. He paced the entire team. He almost finished with 100 scrimmage yards in the first half. That's well, so absurd. That, that that deep catch. Dude, it's first of all, Josh Allen is a freak. But that, rolling that rem- to the right. Did that remind you of Patrick DeMarco? <laughs> it was single coverage, not double coverage. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing. Do you remember when I was complaining about the Ray Davis pick? And how I liked I like Braylon Allen. Yeah, yeah. And I liked some of these other running backs who they picked in st- who they picked Ray Davis over these other guys. Uh Braylon Allen. There was a couple other guys who were available at the time, and I was just it didn't make sense to me. It makes sense now because you see what a fluid running back he is. He runs with power, clearly. I mean, like I said earlier in the show, all of his yards came after contact. He runs with a lot of power. Low pad level, great contact balance. And at the same time, look at his hands as a receiver. He was the Bills' most efficient offensive player the entire night. Yeah, Ray Davis was on point. And I'm going to want to see going forward, James Cook, couple runs. Okay, you're tired. Get out. Ray Davis in. I want to see them in the future rely more on this run game that well, they have. You saw something different than what you saw in the Houston game, because during the Houston game, I pointed out, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to steer into the run when you're getting eight yards on first down and then you're losing two yards on second down. And now you have to throw and then you're walking off the field. It's hard to establish the run when you're losing, having negative plays. Last night, they stayed consistently on schedule using their rushing attack. And a lot of that comes down to just the offensive line. Aaron Cromer and this offensive line deserve a lot of credit. Cromer specifically, because like he he basically has been teaching them to treat their opponents like they were 16-year-olds stealing his chairs. Look, and what I what I think that you're starting to see is these guys becoming like, Chris, when was the last time you saw, back to 2020, when Josh Allen took his jump forward, when was the last time you saw a Bills offensive line impose their will on another team from a running standpoint? Uh, I'm going to say when we had Rex Ryan as the head coach against San Francisco. There was also at, a, at the at the Ralph. There was also a uh, Miami game where Carlos Williams had like 130 yards and two touchdowns. Or that Miami game where we only had 11 on the field, and then they Jay Ajayi. You mean 10 on the field? And then Jay Ajayi just like ran it to the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Real ground and pound, Rex. <laughs> nice job, idiot. <sighs> It is funny that guy went on to be like, I I think it's hilarious that the foot fetish stuff didn't derail his career. It it wasn't, it was just before cancel culture. (laughs) So Bud Adams gets caught by cancel culture, but not Rex Ryan. Yeah, yeah, because he has more money. (laughs) So the offensive line is a huge part of our success. But what I like is, think about this, the Cromer line that you remember back when he was here, like, his first stint with Buffalo. Nasty. Think about Spencer Brown and Deion Dawkins last night. I think Spencer Brown takes to that type of coaching. Oh, sure. Spencer- there's that one play he <laughs> sat on a guy. He, he just manhandled him. <laughs> they flagged him. They were like, because I'm like, oh, what? I'm like, okay, fucking rafts, you're throwing another flag. What is it for? And then they replay it, and it's just Spencer Brown shoves a guy, and then as he's trying to get off the ground, Spencer Brown just throws his entire body weight directly into the guy's spine and just buries him into the turf. I go, oh, yeah, no, no, that's a personal foul. That is a wow. <laughs> You can see the contempt that they had for the Jets last night. 
Think about that fracas that happened when the lights were off. And Deion Dawkins gets a penalty. And you see one of the Jets players trying to talk about like when when in the aftermath, when they're discussing the penalty and you see one of the Jets defensive players going like this, like doing the thing with his elbow and like pointing to it. And the referee was looking at him, shaking his head like, nah, and he's laughing. And then you hear Deion Dawkins explain later that the water boys got too close to him and he snatched the water bottle out of the kid's hand. It was like, get the fuck out of my face. <laughs> Deion Dawkins and like him and Spencer Brown embodied the contempt that I think Aaron Cromer coached these guys into having for the Jets last <laughs> Hold on, night. hold on. We, we got to... We got to go sidetrack. We hundred percent sidetrack right here. Oh boy! Because I'm interrupting the show. Belt in. I'm interrupting the show. I'm. We're going. I'm looking at, looking at you, you people. So this happened four days ago. Obviously, it's because Chili's is the new golf course. It's where business happens. Also, Southwest egg rolls, frosted pint of beer, legitimately trumps anything on a at McDonald's at Wendy's or at Taco Bell menu, hashtag Chili's 3 for me. <laughs> Chili's, you're a winner. Please send us a DM with your full name and yeah! email address. Woo! For, for your Chili's, Chili's for me, Pry. What the fuck Guys, are you doing? my Tuesday just keeps getting better, baby. The Bills are on top of the AFC East. The Bills got Amari Cooper, and I just got myself some free Chili's for quoting The Office. And making fun of fast food. Yes! This might be the best podcast night of all time. <laughs> I, don't what? Give, I don't give a fuck that the live show cratered. I'm the winner here. I'm the hero of the night. <laughs> what are you doing tweeting <laughs> at r- restaurants? <laughs> I'm incredibly bored, Chris. You have no idea the stuff I do in my free time. <laughs> So with that said, guys, I'm so fired up right now. You have no idea. I'm so excited. I can already taste those egg rolls. <sighs> Southwest egg rolls. Chris, when's the last time you were at Chili's? Uh, so this is like a, um, anybody out there, we'll go here. Anybody out there that is currently dating or maybe in a new relationship in that zero to six month window. And if you're going to go have a date night and your lady says to you, uh, yeah, well, let's go out to eat. Uh, and then you go, all right, well, where would you like to go? And then they say, oh, it doesn't matter to me just as long as I get to spend time with you. And then you insert name of local restaurant. So for Buffalo, let's say, oh, uh, do you want to go to Mulberry? No, you know, I don't like their meatballs. Because they just said no. I don't want that. I, I'll go wherever. I'll and go then wherever, you, then except you, for the thing you just said. Yes. So then you just take him to Chili's or <laughs> Applebee's. That's that's what you do. You go. You go like this. You go get in the fucking car, and you don't. You don't because because if you're in Buffalo, you don't drive just to any Chili's, Applebee's. Go to the Chili's in Niagara Falls or Applebee's in North Tonawanda. You pick the shittiest location. And you take him to Applebee's. Chris, I'm shocked that you're divorced. <laughs> hey. <laughs> that's that's my uh my go-to. If Chris is nastier than Chris is nastier than Spencer Brown. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a date night enforcer. But realistically, it's nice to see that fight from your trench players, right? And that's what paced the game for us was just our offensive line's ability and willingness to get nasty with their front seven guys getting to the second level and throwing mean blocks. Edwards fits right in in that capacity. I doubted him this offseason. Now, Connor McGovern's the guy I'm worried about. I'm worried like, hey, Edwards fits in. I don't know what to do with our center. Last night, he was OK, though, or at least he didn't ruin the game. So you can get by with him for now. It's just crazy, Chris, to think like we took it to them on the ground. And that's the reason we were able to keep pace in the first half and have a lead late, like late in the first half. You have a commanding lead. You're firmly in control of the game. It's because of that rushing attack. And a lot of it goes to just Ray Davis and Aaron Cromer teaching this line how to be nasty again. All right. I already I already hit up. uh 
Chili's with your email address and full. They said, please send us a DM with your full name. So I clearly said Andrew Dallas Gear. Damn it. In your in the DMs. That's hilarious. And guys, when you think about everything that went on, the Jets weren't slouches last night. Firing Nate Hackett gave the Jets some wrinkles. Like one of the. Well, they didn't fire him. They demoted. He's a coffee fetcher now. Hey, yeah. bagel guy, go get it. It's like Boondock Saints. And the, the, <laughs> Todd Downing is Willem Dafoe and he just steps in. He goes, <laughs> Nate Hackett's that original detective who sucks with the Boston accent. Bob Marley. And Willem Dafoe just shows up and yeah, is like. Bob Marley. That's the actor's <laughs> name. He goes, I think he goes, go get me a bagel. And he goes, and then he, he like has some other idea. And he goes, I think I'd like a coffee with my bagel this time. <laughs> it just kicks him out of the room. <laughs> they, they ran a play, like a perfect example of it. They ran an inside route, a post route, and then ran a running back rail route with Brees Hall, knowing that the wide receiver would clear out everybody and behind him, they could just throw it to the running back. Easy concept, something that had been completely missing from the repertoire, and they hit it. Or there was another play when they saw that we were playing man and you see Aaron Rodgers check to something. They know that our linebacker, Terrell Bernard, is over here watching the bunch formation trips over on this side. And they've got one wide receiver in the slot over here lined up against uh, Teron Johnson. All he does is run an inside route. And there's nothing Teron can do because he's playing a zone. He's trying to keep him from getting outside. But whereas in that zone, he would like man defense, he would normally pass him off. I think it was originally meant to be zone, but then they saw the bunch over here and everybody shifted pre-snap. And there was just this giant hole in the middle of the field and the jets identified it. And the coordinator was coach was like, Hey, get that. So he hot routes. And next thing you know, it's just a play that Teron's just off from making, but he has no support. The safeties are back because of the routes the other wide receivers are running. It's an easy pitch and catch for like eight yards on third down. That's the type of stuff the Jets haven't been able to do over the last few weeks. So I do think that firing their coaches had an impact, and it's why this game was so competitive for as long as it was. That's why they had to go get Devontae today. Yeah. (laughs) But then ultimately, we had stars. We had stars, and they didn't. Our stars showed up. You think about it. Deion Dawkins, Spencer Brown, they showed up. They answered the bell. Then when it mattered late, you had guys like Teron Johnson making ridiculous that interception. How many defensive backs in the NFL can make that pick? That was that was one of the greatest interceptions I've ever seen. The athleticism to get over there and get down and get your arms under the ball. It was an incredible absurd. pick. Like the fact that everyone wants to yell, you know, Aaron Rodgers wants to blame the now released or up for trade or whatever the hell he is. Mike Williams. He wants to blame the wide receiver for not making a play on the ball. But the reality is you under threw that ball, even to a guy who was on the ground. And there was the slimmest of like, window for that ball to be intercepted but Teron Johnson got it you go back to the Houston game you know what we needed Chris Terrell I mean what is it uh who's the linebacker Joe Andreessen Terrell Bernard yeah Terrell Bernard had an interception that game probably ends differently if we have Teron Johnson for the Houston game you know when I was at work I almost ripped the TV off the wall on that throw that went by Bernard's hip I almost the long I, one. Yeah, yeah I know. I, almost, I know the one you're talking about. I almost ripped the television off the wall at work. The bill so showed mad. a lot of composure in that. And here's where I, I think that the they fell. All right. Because my final thoughts for the night on the game itself. The Bills are now 21. This is from Howard Simon. The Bills are now 21 and 5 versus AFC's team since 2020. We're 7 and 2 against the Jets. We're eight and one against the Dolphins. We're six and two against the Patriots. We're two and a half games up in the division in a season that was supposed to be a rebuilding year. This was supposed to be the year that we were the down team, Chris, and we're dominating these assholes. Well, that's what the national media said. And then you think about how last night went, all the penalties, all the bullshit, all the failure from your coach, from your kicker, from the referees putting you in bad spots at the end of the day. We still somehow have more special talent and 
talent that's willing to execute and ready to go than anybody else in our division. Whether it's Teron Johnson sliding interception, whether it's Terrell Bernard making tackles for loss, whether it's A.J. Epinesa just whooping their tackles ass and getting sacks. Think about that last drive of theirs. The last drive where the Jets are like, we have to have this. How many sacks did they give up? (laughs) Yeah. It's this team is too talented. And this is a rebuilding year, Chris. We were missing one of our starting defensive tackles. We were missing our starting running back. And we are starting linebacker. And we are still a more talented team than they are. Because they're the fucking Jets. So then you like you watch them go out. And this is where we switch over to the Amari Cooper conversation, because holy fuck. In the aftermath of that game, I had no doubt. Like you're a two and four football team. You're the New York Jets. You're two and four. Yet you get more run and you get more press. And also, as everybody knows, they created a a, they created a a Super Bowl window for themselves. The second that they divested of all this stuff in order to get Aaron Rodgers. So the idea that they were going to trade for Devontae Adams didn't seem crazy, did it? No, they were one of the only teams in the NFL that had the ability to make the money work. Yeah, Yeah. You know, like every Bills fan's going, oh, the Bills are calling. They need to get it done. Why? Why do you have to get it done for an older wide receiver who you don't know will match your quarterback? And also, the money that he's owed is crazy. There's no way to make it work with our current books. It's a non-starter. But sure, let's scream about it. Can I scream about DK Metcalf? Oh, my God. (laughs) You you saw those messages? <laughs> yeah, yeah, with Greg. From some couple some one. some idiot tweets out. Well, if we don't go after DK Metcalf, then our our Brandon Bean's not serious about making this a better team. And all Greg could respond with, because as nice as he's trying to be, is DK Metcalf's cap number for this year is like twenty something million dollars. <laughs> That's not a movable object. You people, this is the WGR callers. And this is why I give guys like Greg and the people got like Mario and Paul over at hashtag and all of the guys who go out of their way to interact with their fans on that level. Like, hey, I want to teach you some things. God bless you. Because people who are morons, I have no time for. When I hear a caller who clearly doesn't understand the NFL salary cap, but still feels entitled to yell about a hot take or an opinion about what the what the bill should do. I can't listen to it. I'll bite a whole out. Chris, I'll bite my steering wheel. Yeah. With these fucking shark fangs. So understandably, the bills needed an upgrade in talent. And I think last night's win probably cemented it in Brandon Bean's mind. Hey, we're two and a half games up in our division. It, and now our schedule gets easy. Chris, if we had lost the game last night, I don't know that they don't make this trade, but also it gives him less incentive to do it. You make this trade because you believe in this year. At the start of this season, it seemed like a rebuilding project, didn't it? Yeah. Okay. Retooling is what they call it. Sure. That's a fancy that, that, that that's the white collar way to say we're rebuilding because you don't want to offend anybody. But now that you're four and two and you have a two and a half game lead in your division with a softening schedule, you all of a sudden believe that, hey, wait a minute. If I just add a few things, maybe I can actually make make some run here. This doesn't have to be just a lost year. And I think that that win went a long way towards cementing it in Brandon Bean's mind that, hey, tomorrow morning, I got to make that call. Yeah, we got Tennessee, Seattle, Miami and Indianapolis as our next four. So you could. Buffalo could easily go uh, on a 5-0 run here, including last night's win. It's crazy to see what's in front of us now. And so you bring in Amari Cooper. Roll Tide! Woo! Chris, I'm going to be the most obnoxious. Do you know how much I love it when an Alabama player makes their way to the Buffalo Bills roster? Yeah, I remember Reggie Ragland. Yeah, and here's the problem. Every Alabama player we've taken, it either goes well for a little while and then blows up or just craters on impact. 
Reggie Ragland. Marcel Cyrus, Darius. Mar- well, Marcel Darius was great right up until he decided that he'd made enough Captain money Hat. and started smoking the ganja on a boat. Yeah, Cyrus Quanjo. Cyrus Quanjo, just naked in a field. Yep. Jesus Christ. Do you know that that's the most memorable thing he ever did as a Buffalo Bill? Yeah. I believe it. So in that way, I'm pumped that a, an Alabama alumni is going to join the Buffalo Bills. Here's what I think about in the aftermath of the first of all, Chris, what was your first reaction? I want to hear it. When you realized that, like, hey, when I te- when I texted you just one thing, Amari Cooper. I assume that we got him in a trade. I don't know because football is so uh, – the t- the timing and the – verbiage that you have to learn within a playbook i don't think that we're gonna see a return on investment for like two or three weeks i'm not sure amari's gonna come in hit the ground I don't even, if he does he pl- even play on sunday we don't know i mean he's gonna be here for the whole install week but maybe against maybe he'll play against seattle for sure but the chemistry he's got to get down with josh the timing with all the routes, learning all the verbiage, I think it might be two to three weeks before we see a real step with the, the chemistry between Josh and Amari. I don't know that he's going to come in first game, nine targets, 125 in a tutty. I don't foresee that happening. What I believe you need is some time. There's going to be install time, but that's okay. Because who do we have up next? The Tennessee Titans. Great. Seattle, Miami, <clears throat> Indy. You're talking about a group of opponents who aren't, you know, like you look at Seattle and you say, well, they, they've got a great record. And then you go, but they did lose to the Giants. <laughs> they lost to the Giants. You go, okay, maybe that's a team we can get. And then you look at, Miami and go, I don't know if you're talented enough because you just got into a rock fight with the Patriots. You had your bye week. You're hoping to get Tua back, but also what does that do for you? You were still like you weren't hitting the ground running week one when you had him. No. So what is this now? What does this look like that he's coming back post concussion? Is he actually ready? They've got more questions than they have answers. Plus, they've lost a number of key contributors to injury. Javon Holland broke a bone in his hand. Jordan Poyer's been banged up. They lost Jalen Phillips for the year. Into his absence, this thing, this unraveling of a roster has continued. You're looking at the, the Indianapolis Colts. It's Joe Flacco, right? It's Joe Flacco and Taylor and like, there's nothing dynamic or surprising about them. They're not a special team. They just are sound mid as they they, they, they are a middling team that if you sure, if you dick around with them, you can lose to them. If you do your job, you play assignments on football, you're in that game for four quarters. So what you did was you opened a window and now you bring in Amari Cooper. And when I look at this, the first thing I think is, you know, I I was in, I was literally in a Twitter spaces today when it happened. I've started doing this now when I work from home, if I'm sitting there and I'm working on spreadsheets and stuff, I'll jump into a Twitter space. Today, it was a Jets space. For an hour, I listened to Jets fans just scream and talk about driving their car off the road on their morning commute. It was awesome. And then I switched over to a Bills one, and while I was in it, and we were literally talking about the shortcomings of the Bills offense, the the trade news broke. And I'll never forget this. A guy named Whittle, who I'm going on his podcast tomorrow night to talk about this, said, yo, I need someone to get me that that meme template from The Wire, where it's Idris Elba going, I want you to tell everybody we're back up. And instead he goes, I want you to tell everybody we twist and dicks. (laughs) <laughs> we twisted dicks in here We're the Buffalo Bills We just got Amari Cooper We're twisting dicks And realistically that's what this is You just gave Josh Allen Something he hasn't had In six weeks Which is a, a receiver who's a veteran Who's savvy Who is otherworldly talented In terms of instincts And then you look at what we're The guys were pushing down the totem pole For him Chris is it a shock to you that MVS was the guy who got the axe? 
<laughs> I, I, I didn't even know that. I didn't even yeah, see that somebody see? got cut. So I said it in the spaces. They were like, well, who takes a backseat to Amari Cooper? I go, dude, Samuel and MVS play no special teams. None whatsoever. So both of them can ride pine. At the same time, Samuel, last night when he caught that deep ball, he tried to run away. He tried to run away to the middle field. And if this was Khalil Shakir that had caught that deep ball that that Samuel caught, he probably, with no safety up over the top, he probably makes it to the center of the field and runs the thing in for a touchdown. Samuel made it seven, maybe eight feet before defenders who were completely flat-footed caught up with him. Now, I don't know if it's his age. I don't know if it's the toe issue, but whatever it is, his explosiveness, his speed, it's gone. He can't contribute to this offense anymore. And so I almost feel like that also played a role in them executing this trade. But MVS getting released, Chris, who gives a shit? Who cares? Do you miss MVS? No. I didn't even know he was here. Do you know that? Well, exactly. <laughs> what did you do? What is it? Like if they called him in, like it was a meeting with the Bobs, they're like, what is it you say you do here? And he goes, well, I run that nine route. Cool. I ran a post once and Josh tried to throw it to me and I dropped it. <laughs> they're like, yeah, give me your playbook. <laughs> get, 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 get out of here. Just, just go. Now, this is what I like. The Amari Cooper signing gives them enough competent pass catchers. And the fact that Tyrell Shavers didn't look like a slouch, is this finally time to put, maybe you can make Curtis Samuel a game day inactive? Possible. In a game like this against the Titans, where you're going to try to run the ball, you're not going to throw it a ton. Their pass defense, despite LeJarrius Sneed being a slouch, is a slob. Maybe you, to a, a part of me almost wants to put him on the IR. And just let him get healthy. But now you don't have to worry about who's going to supply skill to our wide receiver core. Trust me, there's a guy. We've got a guy for that, Curtis. You can go sit down. I love the fact that he's number two and now the conversation is starting. How does he get the number from Tyler Bass? Somebody stepped in. They were like, oh, him taking, he's going to take number two when he gets here. Because that's been his number his entire NFL career. Do you know that the only way that you can change jerseys in season with active players is if one of them's cut? That I did not know. Chris, the Bills have the opportunity to do the funniest thing ever. (laughs) Cut Tyler Bass for a jersey number? Uh, and when you think about the schematic advantages it gives us, and, or even just the trades of the day, since we're here talking about Jets bills, as we kind of wrap this conversation up, for the Jets, does this trade for Devontae Adams fix their problems? No. Chris, every time their quarterback was pressured last night, it turned into a sack or a hurry or a quarterback hit or some, some negative consequence for their quarterback. Meanwhile, their running game wasn't as robust. Like, it, it, they did well. Yeah. But one of the craziest things is, Chris, do you know how many light boxes? Or here's the thing. How, how many heavy boxes, eight-plus defenders, do you think Brees Hall saw last night? I have no idea. Zero. The Bills never once loaded the box. So when Brees Hall puts up season best running yards it's because we didn't even try to stop it we just said hey we know aaron Rodgers is going to be the reason you win this game fuck you come get us let Brees hall run the ball and then in a play that you know taylor rapp who i would say deserves some flowers because danger you know danger you know fire close (laughs) danger close taylor rapp he showed you what the upside of that dangerous play style is when he's on. And then just his athleticism, like he came from across the other side of the field, Chris, to cut off Brees Hall and stop his touchdown run. Did you see that play? No, I didn't. I was on my way to work. Brees Hall's breaking down the left sideline to what looks like a sure touchdown. Rap comes from the other hash 
to cut him off at like the 10. And it's a drive where they end up kicking a field goal. <laughs> They're only second half points. So in this way, it's one of those things where the Jets have more problems. <laughs> they have more problems than just one wide receiver. It doesn't absolve them. It doesn't fix their offensive line or the tackles who are getting beat up by AJ Epinesa. It doesn't fix the other players who aren't carrying their weight. It doesn't care. It doesn't fix your run defense. It just gives Aaron Rodgers another guy in the building he can play golf with and talk shit about the head coach about. Meanwhile, for the Bills, how many of our problems does our trade solve? Man, think about it. Schematically, he's not a burner. You know, it's uh, yards per pass on uh, Twitter. Did a deep dive into his film and had some really nice insights. Guys, go check it out on Twitter, yards per pass. But basically said after looking at his games, the deep ball thing isn't there anymore. Like he's not streaking down the field, burning people, whatever. At the same time, like he, they, they point everyone who's a detractor of this trade goes, well, we could have had that guy, but instead we got Cooper and he's in the PFF doghouse. He's got the highest drop rate, whatever. He's rated a hundred out of a hundred receivers. He had 1,200 yards last season, Chris. That doesn't just evaporate, does it? No, and he's got a better quarterback now. And, like, he came from a team that in the offseason bootleg football podcast, Brett Coleman and EJ Snyder, two smart football people, right? Mm Mm-hmm. They called the Browns offense a Ferrari with square wheels. (laughs) He's going from that to the Buffalo Bills, who are churning out 20, 30-point games with nothing. They've been over here making water into wine on offense for weeks. And it's been ugly, and it's been tough, and they've been trying to figure it out. He was a target monster when he had 1,200 yards. I don't expect him to be that guy. He's not, and anybody expecting Stephon Diggs in his prime, you're not getting that. What you're getting, though, is a big physical wide receiver who is the most nuanced route runner on the entire roster right now. The guy who, when he's manned up, understands how to run a tight route, get separation, make himself available, and catch the ball when it's delivered to a catchable location. If he's half the player he was last season, and he gets better quarterback delivery than he's gotten all year from just Deshaun Watson, who Chris... It's not a it's not a secret that he's having one of the worst seasons for any quarterback in NFL history. Oh yeah. If he gets half of like half of that back and he also gets a better quarterback performance, this guy has the chance to be an absolute juggernaut for the right team. And oh, by the way, he's a really good run blocker because he's big. He's built like a brick shit house. Chris, doesn't that fit right in with the narrative of all of our yeah. wide receivers? Yeah. I don't remember Diggs ever run blocking very well. No. And now, now the beauty of this is you have a legitimate boundary threat. A wide receiver who can play the Z so that you can take Keon Coleman and say, look, we're going to go let Mac Hollins play on the outside and we can move you to the slot sometimes. And then we can roll out an 11 personnel formation that has heavy, good run blocking wide receivers. And you can mash downhill in the running game if you want to. And at the same time, you can go and you can play the intermediate passing route game and know that every single wide receiver for you on the field. Oh, by the way, if you want to go, you know, four wide receiver set, Khalil Shakir. You, you've got a bunch of Redwoods that everyone has to be worried about physicality in terms of beating their defensive backs, and then you put Shakir in the slot and let him go to work. This team just got more options. At a time when I think, Chris, we were starting to get exposed for being limited, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Like the Ravens pretty much showed Houston, like, hey, look, Buffalo doesn't have shit if you don't give them shit. In that Houston game, Josh went went nine for 30. Yeah, it was awful. You can't have that. No. 
So then this week, they came in and said, fuck it, we'll run the offense through the running backs and then make you make us stop. And then luckily their secondary, assisted with a lot of dog shit penalties, proved to be the thing that moved momentum towards the Buffalo Bills for all this. I just think that in the aftermath of this game, the win and the way we won kind of set the precedent for Breen that, hey, today I've got to make this call. If you lose, I don't know that it's the same thing. Maybe he still makes the trade. But I think winning and knowing that you now hold a two and a half game lead in the AFC East is a massive reason that you saw this happen today. Because now they know, hey, look it, we are in the driver's seat. And Chris, to your point, the schedule softens up. Yep. You get him incorporated. Got a five week run to get him ready for Kansas City. So now by the time you go to play the back half of your schedule, when you get into December, where the Buffalo Bills are traditionally dialed in, you're going to have a legitimate threat at wide receiver that you didn't enter the season with. And oh, by the way, he costs you fucking nothing. Can you look up the Cooper cap thing for me? Just out of curiosity. What are we on the hook for? Because I know this year his total cap damage is like a million dollars, which makes him a perfect fit. Now what? Oh, so that's just a bunch of void money. Awesome. (laughs) I'll take that. I'll take that every day and especially today. And Chris, do you know that the, do do, do you know the compensation? Uh, It's like a third and a seventh or a third and a sixth. Third and seventh. And we got a sixth back. Cool. How crazy is this trade? Can we just be a fly on the wall for one of these calls? If you're Brandon Bean, what dirt does he have on these guys? Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to be a fly on the wall for these Brandon Bean conversations. (laughs) <laughs> him talking to other GMs or him talking to free agent like players and their agent. How does he negotiate these things? It's wild. I love it. I love where we are today. You know, last night I was frustrated. I tweeted something out that caught fire. Ultimately, Chris, we're two and a half games up in the AFC East and we just acquired a wide receiver that could cure a lot of our ills. It's all gravy if you're a Buffalo Bills fan. And so in that way, I'm going to crack another golden bullet and celebrate the fact that the Buffalo Bills now all of a sudden have a future where it felt like they didn't have one before. Guys, this has been a lot of fun. Trust me, I can't wait to talk about more Amari Cooper stuff. I can't wait to talk about more Bills victory stuff. But for time, we got to get the hell out of here. I'm Drew Gear. That's Chris Krueger. This has been your Rock Power Report.